Uh, I want to talk to you about Canada. And you you might not care about what goes on in Canada because we're just a little country where you're hat, basically. Um, <laughs> Canadians like to say America is our underpants, but um, uh, it's not a topic of immediate interest to people uh, in the US, but uh, I hope you all realize that uh, in Western countries, particularly those that share a uh, a tradition of uh, legal tradition, uh, the roots of a legal tradition, they tend to adopt things one after another. So Canada will do something, and then everybody else will go. Britain will go, and Australia will go, and US will go. Oh, that seems like a good idea. And then they do the exact same stupid thing. So uh, the subject is Bill C-51. That's Bill C-51 of 2017, not the 2015 Bill C-51 that was uh, an anti-terrorism bill. Um, this one's an omnibus bill, so they stick lots and lots and lots of things in there, and uh, it has some pretty broad implications in uh, concerning sexual assault law. Among other things, uh, it will apparently, according to the Canadian Department of Justice, bring sexual assault law into the current century. And, uh, okay, next slide. Proponents of this bill insist that changes to sexual assault law, like those decriminalizing witchcraft and dueling, because that's also in the bill, they're merely updates. Uh, these proposed uh, amendments, provisions, will fundamentally alter the statutory definition of consent, as well as uh, the due process protections uh, for defendants and procedural rules for admissibility of evidence. And I'm going to go over them one at a time. First, next slide. Okay, so to clarify that an unconscious person is incapable of consenting, which reflects the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in RVJA. And uh, just so you know, uh, what's going to follow is a little bit racy, because um, I'm going to describe the details of this particular sexual assault case. Next slide. Um, it does indeed clarify that an unconscious person is incapable of consenting to sexual activity, but it does more than that. It actually clarifies that a person is incapable of giving legally valid consent in advance to sexual activity that will occur while they are unconscious, even if they have requested said sexual activity. Um, so this is what is in our case law, and this is what will be instantiated if Bill C-51 passes. It's just had its second reading in Parliament, and it's gone to committee. Next slide. Now, this was an interesting case, no less so because it was based on a maliciously false allegation. According to the findings of fact on which the decision was based, J.A. and his long-term sexual partner, we will call her K.A. here, um, were kink enthusiasts, and their kinky repertoire sometimes included erotic asphyxi asphyxiation. On the night in question, J.A. choked K.A. unconscious. Both parties estimated that she was out cold for about three minutes. While she was unconscious, he tied her up and inserted a sex toy into her anus. When she came to, he untied her, he removed the toy, and they continued to have hot, sweaty, kinky sex for the rest of the evening. A couple months later, they had one of those epic end of the relationship fights, and uh, during that fight, J.A., uh, and this is interesting, threatened, uh, it's quoted as threatened in the uh, decision to seek custody of their young son. Soon after, K.A. went to police and reported to them that on the night in question, J.A. had performed acts on her while she was unconscious that she had not consented to. Basically, she told police, well, I agreed to be choked out, and I agreed to be tied up, but I sure wasn't agreeing to that whole dildo up my bum thing. And so he was tried for sexual assault, he was convicted, and he was sentenced to two years in prison. Now, he appealed the conviction, and during the appeal phase, uh, it became a finding of fact before the court that J.A. had not, in fact, violated the scope of what K.A. had consented to that in fact K.A. had not woken up with a dildo up her bum that she hadn't bargained for, um, but that she had lied to police and to the court about what had actually happened, and that she had done so with the specific intent of preventing J.A. from getting custody of their son. So his conviction was overturned. But 
in the appeal court's dissenting reasons, a question was raised about sexual consent law in Canada. Namely, is the notion of someone giving consent in advance to sexual acts that will be done to them while they are unconscious legally valid? Because of this question, the entire thing was referred up to the Supreme Court to decide on that. Now, the decision of the Supreme Court has seriously complicated the sex lives of BDSM enthusiasts, as if their sex lives were not complicated enough. But the impact will be felt across broader Canadian society. The Supreme Court found that because sexual consent is defined in law as an ongoing, contemporaneous, con conscious, moment-to-moment -moment process that is constantly subjected to re-evaluation of potential change rather than a fixed state of mind or a binding contractual agreement, the moment J.A.'s partner fell unconscious, her consent to any sexual act done to her while she was unconscious was legally vitiated. They decided that because when a person is unconscious, they are un incapable of changing their mind, um, they cannot be consenting when unconscious to anything, even to acts that they wanted to be done to them or asked to be done to them. Now, here we go. Uh, the complainant's yes, in fact, means no in law. That's the in the dissenting reasons. Now. The dissenting judges argued there are many instances in which people give consent to things that will happen while they are unconscious, like surgery. Another example was two friends at a party who agree to make sure that the other gets home okay. Um, if one of them passed out and his friend picked him up, put him in a cab, and took him home, uh, if consent for that worked the way it does for sex, he would be guilty of kidnapping. Um, so. The, the dissenting judges asked w what makes sex substantively different from these other cases, and the court's reply was, it just is because sex. Slide six. Yeah. Okay, so they went on, the dissenting judges, to say that the majority decision would criminalize common and mundane acts, such as caressing your partner in their sleep or kissing them awake in the morning, even if they told you it was always okay, and even if they specifically asked you to do it before you went to bed. They argued that while the complainant did not have an uninterrupted state of mind throughout the sequence of events, the only state of mind she did have was one of consent. And finally, they argued that the law designed to protect women from sexual acts they did not want to engage in would now criminalize sexual acts women often do want to engage in. Next slide. And the dissenting judge asked, what is protecting someone acting reasonably in all the circumstances when his partner asks him to kiss her awake, when his mistaken belief, his only defense, stems from a mistake in law? His intent no longer matters. The court basically answered, prosecutorial discretion will protect him. Yeah, how do you like that, Vladik? Um, and of course, with that decision, the appeal court's decision was overturned, the conviction was upheld, and back to prison, J.A. went. Because many of the acts criminalized under this precedent are so commonplace, this will put any man who displeases his female partner at a serious risk of prosecution if she's the type of woman who would do that, and if she can find a prosecutor who has it in for, a man, for men. Were, th were this the legal precedent at the time when K.A. went to the police, she wouldn't even have even needed to lie to them in order for him to be charged. He would have just been charged. Her yes, in fact, would be a no in law. I have heard feminists and others defend this state of affairs by claiming that if she's actually consenting to it, then she won't bring charges, so men who consent a woman's wishes during sex don't have anything to worry about. Okay, and this is also what the majority judges in their decision seemed happy to do, trust that prosecutorial discretion will protect individuals from the very situation that they themselves were adjudicating all the way up to the Supreme Court in which they found the man guilty. This is so stupid, it's a, such a stupid defense of this. Given the case on which this precedent rests, an allegation that was false in its description of events and maliciously made, this woman lied to police and to the court to accuse a man of doing something he did not do for reasons that had nothing to do with the sex in question. 
it's the pinnacle of irony that anyone who knows anything about this case upon which this precedent rests would defend this defini definition of consent by saying, well, men have nothing to worry about as long as their sexual partners are happy with the sex. Second, since when do we defend criminalizing common harmless behaviors by saying, well, most people aren't going to object to or be harmed by it, and as long as they don't object and don't feel harmed, it's not really a crime. If I get drunk and get behind the wheel, just because I made it home without hitting somebody does not mean I have not committed a crime. And third, what would this do to the whole problem, the big problem of sexual assault being so brutally underreported? I'm guessing that pretty much everyone in this room is guilty of sexual assault under this precedent, okay? And none of you reported it. What happens when virtually 100% of sexually active Canadians are guilty of sexual assault and victims of sexual assault and none of them are reporting it? Oh my goodness, the underreport rate's just going to go through the roof. Right? Now these are being these changes are being suggested in part to deal with the report rate for sexual assault. We need to get more women to report. We need to make it easier for them to report. You know, all of these things, right? And all it's going to do is the opposite. Okay, slide eight. Okay, second bit would be to amend one of the sections to clarify that the defense of mistaken belief and consent is not available if the mistake is based on a mistake in law. For example, if the accused believed that the complainant's failure to resist or protest meant that the complainant had consented. This would codify aspects of the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in R. V. Ewan Chuck. Now, the Supreme Court precedent referred to, uh, next slide, in this, uh, it was actually a really good decision. It was a good opinion. But the details of this specific case render, uh, that render the decision just um, they would be absent in an amendment. Um, R.V. and Chuck involved a middle-aged cabinet maker with a history of repeated sexual assaults going back to 1969 and a 17-year-old girl applying for a job. And uh, when he had her cornered in his trailer uh, to show her his cabinetry, um, he made uh, repeated overtly physical uh, advances uh, while, all while she was saying no. No, 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 repeatedly saying no. And then in court, he attempted to harness the defense of an honest but mistaken belief in consent. Now, this precedent instantiates into, the precedent instantiated into law, uh, case, case law, in cases such as you and Chuck, you know, it, it can never be implied that a lack of a no means a yes. Well, yeah, it makes sense in this context. But the moment this decision is instantiated into the criminal code, all of that context is gone. Uh, according to the SCC decision, Ewan Chuck committed sexual act the moment he put his hands on the victim in a sexual manner, and in this context, that is absolutely appropriate. But in the form of an amendment to the criminal code, it will apply to every sexual encounter between any persons in any context under any circumstances. There is no such thing as implied consent ever to any sexual contact. Not only is a no always a no, but anything other than an unambiguous yes in advance of that contact is also a no. Next slide. Legal scholars like Joe Kahn of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education have argued that affirmative consent is inconsistent with how most adults have sex. Um, it would criminalize routine sexual interactions even between established couples. As he says, under this consent standard, if one partner touches his or her partner in a sexual way and the other person says, I'm not interested tonight, that person's already committed a sexual assault. And let's be honest, we're not talking person or he or she, we're talking, we're talking he, he has committed a sexual assault because every single decision I've read about sexual assault law and changes to it talks about protecting women from men. <clears throat> As with the proposed changes based on RVJA, one of the most common rebuttals made by proponents of the bill is that it would only be a problem if the victim does object to the behavior in question. People are still free, they say, to engage in whatever sexual activity they wish because if the victim is really consenting, they won't report it to the police. Again, it's only illegal if the victim reports it is not 
a concept. It cannot be a concept in law. It's only a crime if you get caught? Really? Given the context of RVJA, that JA's partner was perfectly happy with the sex in question, and uh, she was happy right up until JA indicated he would seek custody of their son. Reassurances that people are free to break the law as long as the violated party has no reason to be annoyed with them aren't exactly reassuring. Next slide. Another thing affirmative consent laws do is push things in the direction of making rape a strict liability offense. And that means, uh, and that is in fact the stated goal of these amendments, uh, is that insofar as it is possible, we will disregard the defendant's state of mind or mens rea as a potential defense to render the defense of honest but mistaken belief of consent legally unattainable. And the wrongful act then becomes the only thing while the guilty mind is removed from consideration. And uh, I just want to say, it's ironic, prosecutorial deference cannot compensate for the overextension of criminal law. It merely replaces overbreadth and uncertainty at the judicial level with overbreadth and uncertainty at both the prosecutorial level and the judicial level. That is Chief Justice McLaughlin, who incidentally wrote the decision in RVJA. She wrote that in 1998, RVJA. Uh, was 2011, so she's changed her tune. Next slide. Third Amendment is just as concerning, and oddly enough, it's the amendment most lied about by its proponents. Um, this guy here, Andre Marin, um, the, he's a lawyer, and uh, he made reassurances in the press that all that this amendment will do is update rape shield laws to include things that they hadn't included before, like emails and text messages and other modern forms of communication that were not widely adopted when the laws themselves were written. Basically, rape shield law as it exists today, says this lawyer, does not acknowledge the existence of electronic evidence as evidence. This is a lie. He is lying. In fact, there is nothing in the language of the law itself that limits the definition of document to letters, mimeographs, and photocopies on real paper, or communications to telegraphs, phone calls, smoke signals, or utterances into cups with strings. Okay. Likewise, there is nothing in the language of the amendment itself that even mentions emails, texts, or any other modern form of communication or recording. Here is what it will do, according to the Canadian Department of Justice. Next slide. Expand the rape shield provisions to include communications of a sexual nature or communications for a sexual purpose. These provisions provide that I evidence of a complainant's prior sexual history cannot be used to support an inference that the complainant was more likely to have consented to the sexual activity at issue or the complainant is less worthy of beliefs that referred to as the twin myths. Okay, so what they're doing is they want communications of a sexual nature included in the complainant's sexual history and therefore subject to rape shield protections. So any such communication, including but not limited to an invitation by the complainant to the defendant to hook up delivered via Tinder, text message, Pony Express, or Mor Morse code, would now be subjected to rape shield tests. Likewise, for any communication she might send him afterward via Facebook, email, carrier pigeon, or ham radio, that she had a great time and would love to climb him like a fire pole again as soon as possible. All such communications would be required to be disclosed to the defense and to the prosecution and to the complainant and her lawyer in a closed trial, a closed hearing before the trial even begins. Next slide. Now, proponents have also vehemently denied that this provision has anything to do with the acquittal last year of Canadian radio celebrity Gian Gomeshi on multiple counts of sexual assault. In that case, the three complainants sworn testimony did not remotely resemble the only physical evidence presented at trial. All three swore on the stand that after he had assaulted them, they actively avoided any, conf any and all contact with him, but unbeknownst to them, <coughs> He had kept emails and text messages and handwritten love letters dating back at least 10 years, showing that at least two of these women 
engaged in the active pursuit of a romantic relationship with him after the alleged incidents, one of them for more than a year. Um, she even was dancing around the uh, word marriage. Um, and these communications also incidentally revealed a pattern of exquisitely polite brush-offs on his part. This amendment would not only have led to the exclusion, would not necessarily have led to the exclusion of those communications as evidenced at trial, but it would have required Gomeshi to reveal every single one of them to the prosecutor and to the complainant prior to the trial. Given that the basis of the judge's acquittal was not that this behavior on the part of the women was their romantic pursuit of, uh, of him, of Gomeshi, suggested that they had consented because in his words in the judgment, Genuine victims sometimes do strange things, like pursue continued contact with their assailant for months or years. Um, but that the complainant's testimony had been inconsistent with the available evidence, and uh, you know he just could not convict on unreliable testimony, since that was the entirety of the prosecution's case. So this amendment would likely have resulted in Gomeshi's conviction. Um, and it's because the complainants who were shown to have lied, lied maliciously, and uh, all kinds of other really egregious things. Um, every piece of exculpatory evidence would have been revealed to them before the trial and they could have tailored their testimony to conform to it. So, uh, they were also, uh, despite swearing otherwise on the stand, they were found to have been collaborating with each other uh, prior to filing reports with the police and also after having done so, after they would have been warned to not discuss the case with each other. Um, now, would they have changed their stories given their behavior throughout the trial and, uh, and the entire pattern of behavior that was revealed? I think, I think they probably would. Next slide. And here's the last thing. We're going to provide that the complainant has a right to legal representation in rape shield proceedings. And I just want to ask in this case, I mean, yes, you can argue that she could have an advocate and it's not that much harm, but how far are we really prepared to take things? Sexual assault trials already look totally different from other trials. Why would a sexual assault complainant need a lawyer? No other type of complainant does. <coughs> Next slide. Moreover, why on earth is sexual, a sexual assault complainant entitled to be present at a rape shield hearing um, where evidence is being revealed that they would otherwise be unaware of? The complainant is not the plaintiff. They are a witness. Prosecutors are barred from prepping witnesses and are strongly cautioned against unnecessary interactions with them. Witnesses are routinely not permitted in the courtroom to observe proceedings until after they have testified to prevent them tailoring their testimony to conform to evidence that they have seen presented. And while witnesses are free to obtain legal counsel and to engage in mock cross-examinations with said counsel, their attorneys are not entitled to access to prosecution strategy and they have no legal standing in court. The purpose of these measures is to ensure that any given witness's testimony is not tainted by being exposed to evidence they would otherwise not be. These measures are common in all serious criminal cases because the law acknowledges that not every witness, whether they are a complaining witness or just a witness, will be honest. And yet somehow we are willing to suspend all of these safeguards for women who accuse men of sexual assault. Tainted testimony is equally tainted whether the lies are malicious or well-meaning. The system knows this, and yet if B Bill C-51 passes, sexual assault complainants will be invited to review virtually all potentially exculpatory evidence a defendant might bring to his defense before they testify on the stand. And I just want to say here, what a lot of people fail to realize is that the prosecutor's client is not the complainant. It's us. It's the public and the prosecutor is mandated to act in the interests of their client. And it is in all of our interests to ensure in as much as we can that the guilty are punished and the innocent are not condemned. Where the complainant's interests diverge with that, right? they are not the interests of the plaintiff in a criminal case. So I'm gonna warn you guys now, uh, Canada might not be big enough for you to pay much attention to, but what's happening here is going to be a litmus test for you guys. If this bill passes, at best we can stand as an example to others of what not to do. 
And to be frank, things are getting really squirrely up here, even without these changes. Um, I'm going to outline one more case, a highly publicized case that happened in my home province of Alberta and which was heard before a judge whose name is now Mudd. Next slide. In, on direct examination, the complainant was describing what had happened to her in the bathroom at a party. She testified that she was in the bathroom vomiting and surfing on her phone for about 20 minutes alone. When the accused then entered uninvited, she said ninja-like. <clears throat> and announced that he was going to have sex with her. She claimed that she was raped via oral penetration while sitting with her bottom hanging down in the hand basin of the sink and her skinny jeans bunched around her ankles and then raped in the same position by penile penetration by the defendant. Now, next slide. Sink sex. Try it. Um, I would suggest that the women here give it a go. Um, try sitting with your bum dangling down in a basin and your ankles tied together and then ask yourself what kind of boa constrictor like appendages would be necessary to access your vagina. The position will be forcing your knees together. Your bound ankles would only be helping your knees stay together. It would be next to impossible to get them apart. On top of that, your vagina would be pressed up against the inside of the basin's front wall. I used to write erotica. My editor would smack me silly if I came to her with that kind of sex scene. She, she would tell me nobody in their right mind would be able to visualize even consensual sex with the full cooperation of the woman as being physically possible under these circumstances. And you know, the reality is, the difference between fiction and reality is fiction has to make sense. Judge Robin Camp seems to have been in agreement with my editor, uh, but then he made the mistake of mistakes. Um, and he could be forgiven for this because he had barely uh, adjudicated any sexual assault cases whatsoever. Um, he asked her, why didn't you sink, because he's trying to visualize this, why didn't you sink your bottom down into the bowl? Why couldn't you keep your knees together? And in the context of all the events described, um, this question makes a certain sense. But we all know what the activist press does. They isolated the second question from the surrounding context, the question about keeping your knees together, and portrayed Jub Judge Camp's question as if it were a euphemism for, why couldn't you just not be such a big old slut? Not only did they manage to get a retrial, because Judge Camp obviously bought into rape myths, and that's obviously why he acquitted the defendant, but they put the judge in front of an inquiry and found he found himself undergoing feminist re-education and possible early retirement, which he actually opted for the day that the Canadian Judicial, Judicial Council kicked him off the bench. The Globe and Mail managed to get a redacted copy of the transcript, and no one on the warpath paid any attention to it. Uh, none of them, none of our na nation's broadcasters talked about the circumstances of the case that would lead a sensible person to perhaps ask those questions in an innocent context. Next slide. Because it wouldn't do to have that context become common knowledge, Judge Camp, despite having committed no real sin, could serve as an effigy to burn in the larger campaign for gender justice. His question provided the pretext necessary to subject him and the case to a public inquiry on rape myths and the need to amend the law and re-educate judges on how to stop buying into those myths. But the careful reader would have, and I read that whole freaking thing, would have noticed something else about the transcript of the trial. Judge Camp made it clear at the outset that he had no experience adjudicating sexual assault cases and given that the law is very different in these cases, um, the prosecutor, Ms. Mograbi, kindly offered to keep him apprised as to how things are supposed to work. Judge Camp asked many questions during the trial, some of which I will get to in a moment. Um, but first, I want you all to bear in mind that this was not a he said, she said case. There were plenty of other witnesses to events immediately preceding and following the acts in question, and at least one witness who had walked in briefly in the middle of it and then went, ooh, and walked out, okay? And all of them, including a longtime close friend of the accuser, corroborated the defendant's version of events, every single one. 
This particular friend testified in direct contradiction to the complainant's claim that she'd been alone in the bathroom surfing her phone and barfing. Um, and then the defendant came in and raped her. No, far from it. Uh, sh this friend testified that she, another witness, and the complainant and the defendant entered the bathroom together to smoke a joint. And uh, during this time, the two parties began to get friendly. The friend then asked the complainant if she and the defendant were going to have sex, and the complainant replied that yes, they were. The friend and the other person then left the bathroom so the complainant and defendant could have some privacy. Indeed, all of the available witnesses corroborated some or all of the defendant's version of the events and nothing of the complainant's. Next slide. And perhaps most damning, the woman told police when making her complaint that she was really angry at the defendant's brother, who had called her a slut and said he would tell everyone she was a slut for having sex with the defendant. But when she was asked about the sex in question, she said, and I quote, yeah, I just wanted to, whatever. I don't care when he did that to me, like I wanted him to do it. Now. There's an interesting exchange between the judge and the prosecutor near the end of the trial, and this prosecutor had, you know, kindly offered to apprise the judge of how the law is supposed to work. Let's go to the next slide. It's a very stilted conversation, and to paraphrase it, <coughs> the judge says, I believe his version of events, or at least I can't reject his version of events, and in his version of events, the sex was consensual. The prosecutor then instructs the judge, well, it's not enough that you can't reject the defendant's version of events. It's not enough that you believe his version of events more than you believe the complainant's. No one can really know beyond a reasonable doubt that the complainant consented because the sex occurred out of sight of other witnesses and therefore we must assume she did not. The judge replies, well, then I need to apply the air of reality test. His defense passes the test. There is evidence supporting all the elements of his version, and if I am to reject all of that evidence, um, I must believe that no young woman drunk at a party would ever consent to sex under these circumstances, and that doesn't pass the air of reality test. So Judge Camp is following the law. And the prosecutor is instructing the judge that the defendant must have independent, compelling evidence demonstrating consent before an acquittal can be justified. The burden is on the defendant, she says, to prove his innocence beyond a reasonable doubt. And it's Judge Camp who got in trouble. Judge Camp, who was reprimand reprimanded by the Canadian Judicial Council and who resigned in disgrace before he could be forced to step down, the CJC claimed that Camp's conduct erodes public confidence in the justice system. Frankly, I think if more people had acquainted themselves with the actual facts of the case rather than the heavily filtered and redacted version provided to them by the feminist media, what would erode their confidence is the fact that Camp was run up a metaphorical gibbet for upholding the integrity of reasonable doubt and burden of proof. The prosecutor has not even been asked to explain herself or the dubious legality of some of her advice. And yet this case is being used as evidence that the entire system needs reform and formed the impetus behind a bill recently passed to subject all candidates for the bench to feminist training on sexual assault, rape myths, and the proper way to adjudicate sexual assault cases. That has passed. Every single judge who wants to go to the bench is going to be trained by feminists commented to the press that the verdict would have a chilling effect on sexual assault victims and would discourage them from reporting their assaults. It's, you could just script it. And I guarantee you that almost no one in Canada, next slide, is even aware that that entire debacle began with a complainant telling police about the sex in question. Yeah, I just wanted to whatever. I don't care when he did that to me. Like, I wanted him to do it. Thanks.